Okay, so we're moving on to some vascular cases. I did not do an extensive uh, review of, say, endograft complications and that sort of thing. I'm more emergency oriented anyway, but I figure that's the kind of stuff you can uh, easily look up on Radiopedia. So, uh, I've got some emergent cases, though, of vascular pathology that are pretty neat. So, this is a finding known as tree rings. You can see these concentric, they don't have to be calcified. This one is just kind enough to have done that for us. But you will see this tree ring appearance within, the, uh, within a native aortic aneurysm. And it can be layers of thrombus in varying stages of aging as well. So, sometimes it'll calcify and be really easy to spot. Sometimes it can be more subtle. And I really window down on uh, aortic aneurysms and try and detect uh, that kind of laminated tree ring appearance because it is a sign of instability of an aortic aneurysm that there have been effectively stuttering bleeds gradually expanding that aneurysm in a stepwise fashion. So it's a suggestion of an unstable aneurysm and it's one that should be taken uh, with greater concern then would be warranted by just the size of the aneurysm alone, All right? So if I see a four, four and a half centimeter aneurysm, but it's got tree rings, I'm going to treat that as an impending rupture just as much as I would uh, an even larger aneurysm. The other thing that's definitely worth noting here is the rarefaction of the calcified outer wall. You see that one spot where there's a segmental gap and there is actually some stranding, some initial fuzz there immediately adjacent to that. So you want to talk impending rupture. <laughs> that is what we've got here. Uh, this patient needs to go right to surgery. And this is one that you might actually save, right? Because when it frankly ruptures, the survival on emergent aortic aneurysm repairs is really fairly dismal. All right, so a couple of reasons to think that this is an impending rupture. You've got the tree ring finding that suggests a stuttering uh, expansion. And then you've got the rarefaction of the calcified wall right there with adjacent stranding. So that one is just about to blow. All right, impending aneurysm rupture with tree rings. Anybody know the word for the study, the historical study of tree rings? <laughs> the University of Arizona pioneered dendrochronology, uh, which is, you know, counting back tree rings and thus divining weather conditions, uh, natural disasters, things of that nature, and pinpointing them in time. Uh, so, tree ring study is not just limited to aortic aneurysms. All right, this is one that's near and dear to my heart, and I have not shown it in a long time. Uh, this was one of those, uh, you know, I tell all these stories about uh, arguing with people and being right. I hope I've told a few stories about arguing with people and being wrong as well, because that, uh, that definitely happens too. <laughs> so, this was one, though, that I looked at and I said, this is a contained remote aortic aneurysm rupture, because there are these fluid collections that are tracking right along the course that a retroperitoneal rupture would follow. And there is actually evidence of an aneurysm. You can see a little peripheral calcification in that central fluid collection surrounding the aorta itself. So that was one of the arguments posited to me when I said, this is a contained rupture. Someone said, well, I don't even see the aneurysm. Um, and there's not much of it left, but there certainly is some residual peripheral calcification. So, ultimately, this case ended up going to MR, and this whole thing was black on GRE. So, this is all aged uh, hemorrhage products. We don't even know when this rupture was, but it was probably months, if not even years, before this scan was taken. All right, so there is the aortic aneurysm, and here are these fluid collections in the retroperitoneum that you'll see on the cine track along with the vascular structures. Right, and there's a good example of it there. 
So this was a guy who had an aortic rupture and did not present. <laughs> I see it in the psoas muscles there and then down into the pelvis, always really centering on the vascular structures. Just dissected all down the peritoneum and into the pelvis. Pretty impressive. So yeah, this guy had a rupture. It did not come to uh, clinical attention at the time and he came in much, much later. You know, he was probably at risk as well. He's got that filter and he most likely spent some time on anticoagulation in the past. So that makes it all the more incredible that he managed to actually contain this rupture. So he blew an aortic aneurysm. It all dissected throughout his retroperitoneum and then it just walled off, sat there and aged. All right, that is a contained aneurysm rupture. Hey, this one is just one of two cases I want to show that shows gas in or around the aorta. So there are a couple of things you want to think of in that setting. This is all I want to point out too. all the stranding in that retrocrural area. This is a great place to pick up aortic pathology because even though it's in a normal situation, a relatively small area, that retrocrural fat and the diaphragmatic cura themselves are a great indicator of aortic pathology. So I've picked up stranding, and this is, of course, an area where dissections occur as well. So it's a great place to look in general. And I have picked up all kinds of aortic pathology uh, right in this retrocrural region because uh, the tight uh, you know, compartmentalization is, really will reflect changes that are small. Right, so you'll see those crura move, and there's a nice rim of fat always around the aorta there to, to help you pick up stranding as well. So it's a great spot to look. All right, so in this case, there's a lot of stranding. There's clear expansion of the crura, and nobody's going to miss that pseudoaneurysm, basically a contained rupture of the aorta there. But there is also gas, and that is very unusual. That is not a location where you would expect to see soft tissue gas. And so that tips you to the uh, total story here, which is that this was a mycotic aneurysm. It was a bacterial infection in the wall of the aorta that ultimately resulted in weakening in the formation of that pseudoaneurysm. But there is gas immediately adjacent to it, showing you that that was in fact infectious in its inception. So that is a mycotic aneurysm with contained rupture. All right, so another one with aortic gas, and this one is one that actually shows intraluminal gas in the aorta. And this uh, actually with this entity, aortoduodenal fistula, this is actually fairly common. You would think that that uh, gas would be whipped right down the vascular system by virtue of aortic flow. And I don't know if flow is typically slowed to such a point that it doesn't, but in this entity, or, you know, it could be that the influx of gas is so uh, continuous that you're always picking some up. But whatever the case, uh, this is actually a fairly reliable finding that you have gas immediately in the aorta or immediately adjacent. These are almost always a complication of aortic surgery, right? Whether it's graft placement or other types of aortic revisions, um, if there has been surgery on this upper abdominal aorta, then the, the patient is at risk to form a duodenal fistula. So it happens where that third portion of the duodenum just crosses right in front of the aorta. And if it's been surgically manipulated, it can set up an inflammatory process that creates a fistula here. So uh, the one problem with this entity, I have one where a pseudoaneurysm is forming in this big bulging uh, arterial enhancement collection is sticking out into the lumen of the duodenum, but it has not ruptured yet. So the one problem with this entity is you rarely get them with contrast because it's usually such an emergent presentation. In fact, on one of these, I called the referring clinician and she answered the phone and said, you want to tell me why this patient is vomiting gallons of bright red blood? <laughs> 
uh, and I said, I can. Right. It uh, it is a dramatic presentation. So it's one of those two that if you're thinking about calling it uh, about reporting it, I would call the ER and say, hey, does this make sense? Right? Because <laughs> it uh, it should be a pretty dramatic presentation. And if it's not, you might rethink your findings. All right. So we've got this aortic post-op changes uh, that are a, a, a clear prerequisite for calling this entity. And then there is that little dot of gas within the aortic lumen as well. And you can see, although we don't have contrast flowing into the duodenal lumen, we certainly do have blood. And you'll see on the cine that all the proximal bowel is filled with this hyperdense fluid that, of course, is uh, early clot formation. So there is the fistula with a little dot of gas, and you can see you will lose the fat plane. There is always the thinnest fat plane, even in skinny people, between the anterior aspect of the aorta and that third portion of the duodenum. And that is important to look at in a post-op aorta. I always go to that little fat plane. If you see it eradicating, it can mean the beginnings of fistula formation, and it's worth noting even in the absence of a pseudoaneurysm or intraluminal uh, gas in the aorta or intraluminal uh, density in the small bowel. All right, so that is an aorta duodenal fistula in a postoperative aorta. Okay, so uh, our old IR attending used to ask the question, where are the four places that an aortic aneurysm can rupture. And he doesn't mean in the aorta, he means into what four compartments can an aortic aneurysm rupture. And the answer is intraperitoneal, never seen it. I've had residents actually call me up after hearing me say that and say, I've got one. And then they show it to me and it's a retroperitoneal. So if you burst intraperitoneal, meaning through the back of the peritoneum, from a ruptured aortic aneurysm, you are not going to probably survive uh, to come to medical attention is the bottom line. So intraperitoneal, it does happen. It's very rare. You're never going to see it on a CT. Retroperitoneal, far and away the most common. Uh, and that example we saw earlier was, of course, a retroperitoneal. And your typical aortic aneurysm rupture, like the tree ring one, when that goes, that's going to be a retroperitoneal. Third one is duodenum, which we just saw. So you can uh, rupture into the duodenum again, almost always post-operative aorta. And then the fourth one is the IVC. The IVC is lying right adjacent to the aorta. And in a very rare, uh, it's probably around 5% of aortic aneurysm ruptures, maybe even less, it can go right into the IVC. And that's what's happening here. Remember with that AVF case, we saw so much flow coming up the IVC that it was distended and you had retrograde flow into the hepatic veins. And that's what we're looking at here. Got a big distended IVC that's clearly seeing more flow than usual. The other thing that's cool here is you've got such early venous return that we're actually seeing retrograde passage into the left renal vein there. It's actually distending the proximal portion there of the, uh, of the left renal vein near its confluence with the IVC. And that's unusual, right? Because renal vein return is one of the first things you see in a contrast enhanced scan. So the odds of you actually seeing a high pressure IVC retrograde into the left renal vein are pretty low and you've got to have very early venous return in the IVC right to see that happen because normally the renal vein return is going to beat the systemic venous return into the IVC and that's why you get those two density columns coming in from the uh, renal veins that can look pretty wild in, uh, in an early enhanced IVC right because you don't have the systemic contrast coming up so you have hypodense blood mixing with the renal venous return. That's the normal situation. But here, such early venous return up the IVC that we've actually got retrograde contrast in the left renal vein. All right, so here's the culprit. You've got a big aortic aneurysm with a nice, thick, irregular wall. 
and a focal rupture right there in the posterior right aspect of the aneurysm, and it's dumping into the IVC. All the way down, you can see there is retrograde passage. Again, we do not have systemic venous return yet in the IVC. So here in the common iliac veins, you can see that's the lowest extent, the most inferior extent of the retrograde contrast. That's going back against the normal uh, incoming venous flow, and it's because of the arterialization of the IVC. So a lot of cool hemodynamic stuff with this case, and this is one of those that actually warranted a 3D, so we'll look at that in a moment. But there is the hepatic venous retrograde flow. Look at the size of that IVC. There's the left renal vein and its retrograde flow. Right, and you see we're very early in the contrast phase and looking at the nephrograms. And now we're following the retrograde fluid in the uh, retrograde contrast in the IVC all the way down to the common iliacs. Sorry, it cut off a little quickly. Uh, this is what I saw in private practice. This guy walked into an imaging center. Uh, he was sent over. He didn't walk in, actually. He was sent over to our imaging center because the adjacent ER had the CT scanner tied up and they wanted an emergent scan. So they actually ambulanced him over to uh, to the imaging center and did an emergent CT there. So I was there reading knee MRs that day and they uh, scanned this patient and ran over and showed it to me. So I went back to my alma mater uh, in Tucson and I was uh, lecturing to the residents and I showed this case and one of them said, what did you do? And I said, I put him back in the ambulance. So <laughs> he was expecting me to say, well, you know, I scrubbed up and uh, went in there interventionally. No, that did not happen. So there are the hepatic veins. You can actually see that retrograde uh, filling with contrast of the hepatic veins on the 3D. And there's the aneurysm. And there is, of course, that communication between the aneurysm and the IVC. It makes for a Pretty 3D. So that is an aortic rupture into the inferior vena cava.